Well, it's truly an honour to be here. And as a Kiwi, we celebrated in the only style you could. We went to the Peru market, erstwhile known as... Before it was called Peru, it was called... Peru is much more romantic. <laughs> and we purchased, as you do, woolen carpets. And I had to borrow money from the bank of Michael and Marion to, to finance the purchase because the store had run out of cash. Sounds like the US Treasury? No? Right. More, more of that or not. And when I looked at the label, both purchases of the wool carpets came to you per courtesy of the New Zealand sheep. Yay. <laughs> So we walked around the beautiful Londonderry this morning. It's a, a thing that Marion does six days a week. That's why she's so fit in mind and body. And I was asked by one of my walking companions, what is it that had brought me to this prestigious environment? I say G Mall and you say G Mal. I've told the people in the front, don't throw tomatoes at me, but it's really tomatoes, right? I'm getting the accent, kind of acclimatized. And I was asked how I'd secured this absolutely um, very cool speaking slot tonight. Had I solicited? What? I said, no, of course not. I'm a very willing conscript. And I'm a willing conscript at the hands of Michael and Marion Jeffrey, uh, very close friends of ours. They ski far too fast for us and pay the price. Uh, so Crested Butte is where we usually meet each other, and this is our first time to the lovely Vermont. Uh, we, we, we've just loved uh, the experience, so this is the contribution of a willing conscript. So Michael and Marion, now you must know a bit about them. There are a few Brits in the audience. Put your hand up. A Brit? Yeah, just one or two. And Michael and Marion, they were the practitioners of globalisation before it even became fashionable. They've lived in many continents, many places, children been to many schools but they've ended up where their heart is, in Vermont. So thank you, Michael and Marion, uh, for taking us into your home and into your hearts. We really appreciate it. So our boarding party, the Kiwi boarding party. First of all, my husband, Andrew. Now, some of you may have met his cool fashion statement, New Zealand Merino wool. Peter, am I allowed to advertise? Unashamedly, right. Uh, he's also known to me now as my humble administrator. Humble I am not, but humble he is. We were recently in Suzhou, which has the fastest growing per capita uh, income of any city in the world. Uh, and we went to the museum where the architect was L.M. Pei, who died in May of this year at the age of 102. Go L.M. Pei. And he was the architect of that Pompidou Center in the Louvre, uh, the Bank of China that you see against the Hong Kong protests and pose questions about that later, if you will. And he was a native of Suzhou. And next is absolutely stunning architectural statement, which is the Suzhou Museum, is the, is the garden of the humble administrator. And that seemed to fit my husband. <laughs> We're also joined by a very close friend, Sue. If she stood up, you wouldn't see her. She's shorter than I am. Sue is the most wonderful nurse. Our children grew up together. She's a nurse, but I've got a Surgeon General's warning. Do not make a bet with Sue on any aspect of the British royal family. She's going to win the bet, right? Now, so that's the boarding party of two. We're joined by Judy. Stand up, Judy, from Levin. I've got another Kiwi on the case. So in case we feel outnumbered, here's Judy. Okay. So for myself, I come from a very typical New Zealand background. I come from a farming family, which makes me a free marketeer and a feminist. And that's not an oxymoron. That's what New Zealand farmers are. And I always aspired to be the Minister of Agriculture in my political career. But because agriculture is so central to the New Zealand economy, why not be the Minister of Finance, the Secretary of Treasury? So that's what I became. I thought much better to do that, and in my late 30s, I was writing budgets that most people now remember uh, some many decades on. These are two very 
consequential days. The two days either side of tonight are hugely consequential for two reasons. In two days' time, the Communist Party of China will put on the grandest of shows to celebrate 70 years since Mao seized power, kicked out uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, and the Kuomintang, banned them to Taiwan, uh, and the modern, if you like, uh, epoch of uh, communism was begun. I bet in those celebrations in two days' time there will be no mention of the massacre that occurred 40 years on from that event. I'm not talking now 1949 when the Communist Party seized power, but 1989 when they massacred people in their thousands in Tiananmen Square, completely scrubbed as the bodies are from Tiananmen Square and their public memory. I was in Shanghai two weeks ago and I inveigled my way in to the museum that commemorates the foundation of the Chinese Communist Party. Now I kind of look Chinese, don't I? Kind of. No foreigners can go in. My Mandarin is Ma Ma Hu, which means horse, horse, tiger, tiger, more or less. I sort of blended into the crowd, gave my foot, foot my, my fingerprint, and then I was in. So I spent an hour in this museum. And it won't surprise you to know the fingerprints of the Russians, <laughs> and shame them, the French, were all over the foundation of the Chinese Communist Party. I now want to fast forward 70 years to now and my presentation. And I essentially want to pose the question in respect of how are we in the Western world assessing China? What's going to prevail? Greed and fear, which attracts a lot of people to China. It's the biggest number in town. If you want to boost your economy, that's the greed. And the fear is you dare not speak up about Tiananmen Square or the million and a half Uyghurs who are in concentration camps. That's the greed and fear. Or the alternative, what prevails? The values of a rules-based system and the celebration of individual liberty. So those are the two questions I want to pose as we consider the meaning of China. So that's in two days' time. Two nights ago, the three of us, at huge expense, I might say, went to see Hamilton. How many of you have seen Hamilton? Yeah, well, you've felt the economic squeeze as well. <laughs> and we went to see Hamilton, and again, it was the beginning of a dynasty. But this time, in contrast, a democratic as opposed to an authoritarian dynasty. So Hamilton, and I would be attracted to the play, despite the cost, was the first United States Secretary of the Treasury. And like me, he was a practitioner of fiscal responsibility. So after the political demise of Washington, and you know the story better than I do, and then the ascendancy of Jefferson, the latter on taking the reins of the presidency, he remonstrates in song against the budget discipline imposed by Hamilton. And in the dim light of the theatre, I took down the line. And this is Jefferson wanting to spend what he didn't have. I couldn't undo it, i.e. the discipline Hamilton had laid in. I couldn't undo it if I tried, and I tried. Oh dear, that is a familiar refrain from the political class who typically are fiscally feckless. More of that anon. We end this trip in Jordan, and we're going to visit Petra, and if any of you have been down there, you walk through this magnificent ravine, you've got the iron uh, marks of the Roman chariots, you've got the aqueducts at about my shoulder height, and as you go down the end of that ravine, the most brilliant, famous treasury you've ever seen in Petra. Huh. But like all treasuries, it's empty. Right. So what to make of China's rise? New Zealand has been, and this was the original title of my talk, but Michael wasn't quite sure you'd all get it. I know Judy will. 
Uh, New Zealand has been blowing gooseberries at China for 100 years. So let me explain. A hundred years ago, a woman who was a principal of a high school in my hometown of Wanganui, she went to visit her missionary sister who was working in China 100 years ago. Over 100 years ago, New Zealand gave women in the vote, the first country in the world to do so. That's the first feminist cry. Right. So this woman went off to China and she was joined by other fellow travellers from the United States and the United Kingdom. And they visited a nursery of Chinese gooseberries and they were lucky enough to be handed out packets of seeds. So the New Zealand woman got packets of seeds that contained the male and the female. Lucky, kismet. But the British and the U UK, uh, the British and the United States uh, visitors only got the male gene. Bad. Nothing happened. And in New Zealand, we effectively appropriated the Chinese gooseberry. We called it kiwi fruit. We bred all sorts of varieties of kiwi fruit. We are the dominant kiwi fruit provider to the world. Uh, more than half of the world's supply of kiwi fruit comes from New Zealand. So we had China's number a very long time ago. <laughs> now, it is for us uh, a celebration of two things, uh, that you need to make the most of opportunities, Okay, and be savvy about how you capitalise on those opportunities, which we were. But secondly, science now comes into it. So I'm sure many of you have heard of the CRISPR technology where you edit out genes. Well, our Plant and Food Research Institute is editing out, sorry guys, the male gene. Uh, so they're calling it the friendly boy kiwi fruit. There are no boys in it, it's a hermaphrodite. So the friendly boy and the very shy girl are no longer racing at all. You can have kiwi fruit all on its own without boys or girls. So just to table one of my beliefs, I believe that capitalism and science have made the modern world. More of that anon. So New Zealand has developed a very close relationship with China for very compelling reasons. Some of it around greed, some of it around uh, just sheer naked opportunity. But we have been very uh, deliberate in the steps that we have taken. So New Zealand boasts three firsts with China. Remember, we are five million people and they are nearly 1.5 billion. You know, we've got a lot of gall in New Zealand, which is why it was a Kiwi that first split the atom uh, and climbed Mount Everest. No, th that's hubris I'm boasting. Right. <laughs> So we had three firsts with China. We were the first country in the world to write a free trade agreement with China. We sponsored China into the World Trade Organization, bless us. And we were the first country in the world to recognize China as a full market economy. And I'm a living indication of how intertwined we have become. I'll talk about my beautiful silk Chinese jacket made specially for me two weeks ago in Shanghai. I wear a swatch watch with the year of the pig, which is the current Chinese year, and I wear Ponamu, which is New Zealand sacred greenstone. I'm a living embodiment of New Zealand and China. In fact, two of my business responsibilities are these. I'm a director of the Bank of China in New Zealand, and that's one of the biggest banks in the world. Very humbled in Suzhou when I found out the book of business of just the Bank of China in Suzhou is bigger than the whole of the New Zealand economy. Mm. Put you in your place a little. And I'm also a foundation director of New Zealand's biggest infant formula company, and we're one of the biggest suppliers of specialty infant formula to China. Highly lucrative. We are not selling specialized infant formula milk powder. We are selling trust. And I'm going to come back to values in a minute. That matters a lot. 
What struck me when I first visited the head office of the Bank of China in Beijing, fittingly constructed by L.M. Pei, a beautiful building, a little bit like the IMF, I was very struck by their number two in the whole of the Bank of China, who looked at New Zealand's governance regime, our prudential supervision regime, and said to me, ah, I get it. Being a director is not for decoration, and many directors should take that to heart. So we are very intertwined, but the issue is on what terms? I know there's some Aussies in the audience. Hand up the Aussies. One or two? Australians? Yes. You, you introduced yourself earlier on. Let me start now with the equation, the fear and greed versus a values-based, liberty-loving regime. I'm quoting from the Centre of Independent Studies, which is an Australasian think tank. I've been on their board for a long time. Uh, it is entitled The China Challenge, and this is one of their best journalists out of China. And this is how he starts his publication, which arrived in my inbox the day before I left. The rise of the People's Republic of China is helping make Australia rich, but it is also posing an almost existential challenge to its values, alliances and interests, and thus its identity. If you went to Australian universities now, you would find two things. 25% of all Australian universities are foreign students. 50% of those foreign students are Chinese. One. Two, they're learning from us. And it's the same here, obviously, in the United States. And those of you who come from the United Kingdom, the same. Secondly, you will typically find Confucius Institutes in those universities, which is a stalking horse for the outreach of China. They're not stupid. They're not called the Middle Kingdom for nothing. So, back to the protests in Hong Kong, two million people walking in the streets, unaccustomed to protest, in the name of freedom, out of seven million people. And the outreach of the, of the Communist Party of China was penalising students in Australia for coming out in support of those protests. China is everywhere. The influence is everywhere. The greed is everywhere. The Australian economy was rescued by selling coal to China. And the fear is in the eyes of those diaspora of Chinese students, some of whom were born in Australia, who dare, who dare to protest in favour of freedom for Hong Kong. So New Zealand has had its own flashpoints. Let me talk about two. The first was we released a strategic defence review. And while we are a minnow in the scheme of things, and while we thumbed our nose famously at ANZUS many decades ago, nevertheless, we are part of the Five Eyes arrangement, which is New Zealand, Australia, the United States, Canada and Great Britain. Uh, I have two children who serve in the military. Uh, my son-in-law is very active in the Five Eyes arrangement. Obviously, he can't talk to me about it, but I discern certain things. And New Zealand published a strategic defence review. Just, if, if you don't mind, because this is, is a forum for learning, uh, this strategic defence review caused huge, huge pushback by China. How dare New Zealand? We said, one, the increasing... There are three forces and their dynamic intersections that are pressuring the international order. The increasing importance of spheres of influence with some states, brackets China, pursuing greater influence in ways that at times challenge international norms, brackets China. The challenges to open societies and Western liberalism driven by an increasing disillusionment with existing arrangements within these societies threaten to reduce the willingness of open liberal states to champion rules-based order. How many Americans I hear lament the state of your politics? Democracy is chaotic. Democracy is choice. It is not authoritarianism. It's a very different proposition. 
And the third thing is an array of complex disruptors. But more importantly, this strategic defence review went on, and this is the last big quote, so if you'll bear with me, China, now named, is deeply integrated into the rules-based order. It has invested in its institutions and accrued significant benefits from free access to the commons and economic openness, i.e. the World Trade Organization. China's increasing contributions to the international order have been visible across a variety of areas from peacekeeping to counter-piracy. New Zealand and others have encouraged China's increasing engagement on international issues, commensurate with its rising economic stature and in accordance with existing norms. Yet, as China has integrated into the international order, it has not consistently adopted the governance and values championed by the order's traditional leaders. Both domestically and as a basis for international engagement, China holds view on human rights and freedom of information that stand in stark contrast to those that prevail in New Zealand. China has set an alternative model of development, a liberalising economy absent liberal democracy, challenging conventional wisdom in the West that the two go hand in hand. China's trade relationships and economic power have grown significantly, enabling us it to pursue its interests with a much greater confidence and with a wide array of political and economic levers. In Asia, China's more confident assertion of its interests has at times raised tensions with neighbouring states and with the United States. You bet. So hard on the heels of that pretty hard-hitting assessment and calling China out, New Zealand, like many other countries, called out Huawei. You pronounce it H-U-A-W-E-I? What's the other? Huawei. Huawei, right. So we, we too said, no thank you, we're not going to have Huawei in, uh, integrated into our telecommunication system. The Chinese went bananas, they went berserk, there were ambassadors called in, etc. We were frozen out as, as a, uh, a foreign uh, company putting uh, infant formula into China. All of our applications for Chinese regulatory authorities were put on the back burner. They were very, very pissed off. And the New Zealand ambassador, uh, the Chinese ambassador to New Zealand, she said, wow, these are choppy waters. You know, New Zealand has to have its hand on two tillers. Excuse me, she's talking about chi look, looking the fear and greed to China, as well as the values-based system in New Zealand. And Carrie Lam, who is the hapless Beijing puppet who notionally rules Hong Kong, she and the infestor with you know the real truth, which is you can't serve two masters. So New Zealand has had to choose, and we have. Now, having issued those general, uh, if you like, very big caveats and warnings, there's much to love about China. There's much to love about the Middle Kingdom. If any of you can see this photograph here, it, 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 like any photograph, it, it tells a million tales. This is three Chinese warships who steamed into the Sydney Harbour shortly after Scott Morrison won uh, a very unexpected victory in the Australian election. People like to talk about climate change. They don't want to act on the cost of climate change, and he won the election. So these three warships steamed in. There was much wringing of hands. Here are these gorgeous young uh, naval, able seamen uh, who work for the PLA. Uh, so here are these naval uh, um, young people. And what are they carrying? Cartons of infant formula. They weren't there to make war, they were there to make love and feed their babies. So there's a lot to love about that aspect uh, of China. Um, I've got a wonderful thing that I got in China uh, a couple of months ago. You know Jack Ma, Alibaba? Alipay? You know who I mean? Yeah, so Jack, he's their huge entrepreneur. The communists have just shoved him out. No, it's a private company, too bad. You're not red enough for us, out you go. But here is, is this gorgeous young guy putting on lipstick, if you please. Come on, guys, get alive. And you have got here um, a, a, a basically a face-off between uh, this young guy called Lee Chiakui and Jack Ma. So Jack Ma only founded Alibaba. He should know a bit about it. So here they go. They had a competition. And Ma pitted himself against Lee, a broadcaster known for endorsing and selling lipsticks. In the allotted time, 
Lee sold a hundred times as many lipsticks as the business guru. I mean, this the, the way in which they do business is unbelievable. And let's talk about my jacket. Hmm? Very cool. So, on Sunday morning two weeks ago, I spent four hours in a Shanghai hotel marking international essays on freedom. Kind of a contradiction in terms sitting in in communist China uh, for a think tank based out of New York. And when I'd finished at two o'clock, I went to the local silk shop to buy something for my mother. And I saw this jacket hanging up, and I'm like a magpie, I've got to have one of those. Well, of course, I'm not exactly Chinese size, so the tailor said, when are you leaving? I said, tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Oh, too late, come on, come on, we'll set a price, away we go. So he sort of took the measurements, and he said, I'll be ready at nine o'clock in the morning. I bought a jacket for my mother, went back to the hotel, started to pack on Monday morning to leave and found that the jacket was flawed. I need to take it back. So I go back up to the silk market at nine o'clock in the morning and he says, I've got your jacket. Well, I don't know whose measurements it was, but it wasn't mine. So the sleeves are way down here and it was way out here. And I said, I can't have that. He said, when are you leaving again? 11 o'clock. So he took the new measurements on the spot, you know, the tailor chalk marks and whatever. As I checked out at 11 o'clock, Voila, the jacket. They are just amazing. For those of you in business, and this is something that I think is, is you know, really um, important to understand about the dynamic in China. I love America, I love your DNA, you're highly entrepreneurial, but boy, beneath the communist cloak, there's a lot of capitalism that's at work in China. So this is a Bain publication in April of this year. It's called The Three... Uh, the 4D approach. So they're talking about concepts like social commerce. Five times the startups in China compared to uh, the multinationals. So the multinationals are really doing it tough. So here's the 4Ds. Category leaders can hold their position by doubling down on China. They will make China a direct report, the first D. In other words, you manage your domain and just report to the boss. They emphasize their commitment to actively devising ways to design for China, that's the second D, to decide in China and to deliver in China at China speed. That's what we refer to as the 3D approach, which is the design, decide, deliver. And the fourth D is digital capabilities. They are market shifting just phenomenal. Now, here's the unphenomenal thing, talking about digital capabilities. Anybody recognize this? I need to take it out. Anybody got, still got one of these? It's a BlackBerry, yay! I take my BlackBerry to China. All of my colleagues have got these fancy iPhones and whatever, have to leave them away because they will be snooped on, pinched. Uh, you know, the intellectual property uh, will be, will be um, the subject of theft, you'll be listened to. Only my trusty BlackBerry, they can't break the encryption. So I don't have to take a broken phone. I've got a very well-functional phone. I love my BlackBerry. So this, this is my, my, China, my China friend. So let, let me uh, just look at the much to fear. So there's much to love about China, but there is much to fear. So this is a conclusion by a chap called John Garneau, who is an Australian scholar. scholar. Uh, he studied... Uh, as a diplomat, uh, China very closely, and he's looked at all the recent incarnation of President Xi, and he says this, the key point about Communist Party ideology, the unbroken thread that runs from Lenin through Stalin, through Mao, now to Xi, is that the party is and always has defined itself as being in perpetual struggle with the hostile forces of Western liberalism. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is pretty much the bottom line. It is now a matter of how we settle this big clash between these forces. Historically, clashes between forces have been settled by the gun. And as Michael collected us from the Albany railway station yesterday, Andrew and Sue and Michael debated the meaning of the Third Reich. And we know historically about how that ended at the point of a gun. Well, these days, the war is not raged by guns. It's raged by the battle for values. What is the supremacy of the... What is the primacy 
of values. This is the war of values. And I stand in a country and feel privileged to do so, the United States of America, that is most capable of carrying the day. It's an awesome responsibility that you have and you cannot shirk it. America's willingness to draw a line, a line in the sand against intellectual property threat, theft and illegitimate subsidies and preferences to SOEs is crucial not just for the transaction of trade, but it's crucial to the preservation and primacy of a values-based system of international order. That is what is at stake. And President Trump's administration has ensured by the tactics and the hardball that has been employed that the ball is now in China's court. And make no mistake about it, China is on the defensive and has the weaker hand. The authoritarian is never going to win this argument. The weapons now being deployed are tariffs, sanctions, the rule of law, the removal of privileges like the ability to list on the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, I hate tariffs. Tariffs are a tax on exports. So in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, your lumber industry. China imposes a 25% retaliatory tariff. Guess what? Immediately, immediately, the demand for American lumber falls by 40%. There are very real consequences uh, for this. Um, New Zealand has always been an ardent free trader. We can't survive by taking in our own washing. We have to compete and trade with the world. And we're a big Leonard Cohen fan, which is uh, his famous song, which says effectively, uh, there has to be a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. We want to crack tariffs. We want to crack protectionism. We want to crack theft. We want to crack subsidising SOEs. We want the light to get in, which is our ability to trade on the merits and free from that kind of, of interference. My hat goes off to Mike Pompeo. I, I read uh, your, um, your, your media uh, very closely. Uh, Mike Pompeo, he's just been in Australia. He urged Australia to stand with the US against China threats to international security and the rule of law, saying countries should not sacrifice their values for a pile of soybeans. Hats off to him. He's absolutely right. And it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. Um, there is not going to be, and let's be very realistic, there's not going to be a change in the political regime in China, the thread back uh, to Lenin and Stalin. Xi is emperor for life. God help China when he dies, because there's no succession mechanism, uh, and chaos will probably ensure. But the stance of the Americans, the line in the sand in favour of a values-based international order, will force a, trade, a change in trading behaviour to the unambiguous benefit of the world. So last a word on 1989. I've talked a bit about anniversaries and, and beginnings and dynasties and authoritarianism versus uh, a liberal order. 1989, apart from Tiananmen Square, was famous for three reasons, and the last will surprise you. The Berlin Wall fell in 1989. Uh, the internet was created, not by Al Gore, but it was another American who did it in 1989. And New Zealand passed the Public Finance Act. Now, don't snigger. Judy's not sniggering. The Public Finance Act was a revolution in the management of public finance. First of all, we said the state is, you know, it's got assets and liabilities, so we're not just going to account for cash. We have proper accrual-based system, not just the cash in the tin. Uh, you know, I saw as, as I went past the, uh, the Landgrove Town Hall, your taxes are due on the 1st of October. It's in your interest to know how your taxes are spent. And what New Zealand did was to understand that the conduct of public finance is a matter of much consequence. Nations rise and fall. I mean, the fall of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union, was a collapse of the economy and the collapse of management systems uh, that performed, a collapse of relevance and trust in the state. So this week, K 
Kiribati, which is a, a little island in the Pacific, the Solomon Islands. Uh, they joined Vanuatu, Tonga, the Philippines, and effectively pledging their allegiance to China to fund their way of life. They haven't managed their budgets. They haven't ensured fiscal responsibility, and now China is dictating their sovereign pace. They are marching to the beat of a China drum. China's very, very skillful in uh, extending the tentacles in many ways. New Zealand, on my watch, was determined to transform, to transform the conduct of public finance. And guess what? We put in rules, a rules-based system, for the conduct of public finance. So prudent levels of debt, uh, making sure that you were fiscally responsible in terms of uh, your balanced budget, that you didn't have surprises, you had predictability in terms of tax regimes, lots of transparency, lots of accountability. And guess what? New Zealand is the best behaved uh, in a fiscal sense of any country in the world because the principles and the rules have anchored the regime and the rules of the road have changed political behaviour forever. So to conclude, and uh, please you know, feel free to pose whatever questions you will, and many of you may challenge my world view that capitalism and science have made the modern world, but I'll give you a good run for your money. Um, to conclude, a rules-based system matters, and that is the only basis upon which we in the West should deal with China. And that's what this titanic struggle is all about. Go America. And secondly, individual liberty is the North Star. Our national anthem in New Zealand has, among other things, and we hope to be singing it in the final of the Rugby World Cup, <laughs> where we expect the game to be the champions, but our national anthem says, God defend our free land. And we feel a kindred spirit as we enjoy our time here in the land of the free. Thank you. I would like to know if, from New Zealand's point of view, whether our current president is lost in fear. His office is respected. <laughs> our Prime Minister has always been, she met with him at the United Nations the United Nations got some use. Um, you get to meet the big guys, and he is a big guy in our world. Uh, we respect very much the contribution that America makes as a sovereign nation to our security and to the values-based system. There are obviously a range of views. You can read in the New Zealand newspapers, the New York Times. You can read in British newspapers, the Guardian, and you'll get one view or you could read the Wall Street Journal and you'll get another view. New Zealand's attitude is we need to be converging on what matters for us. The office matters for us. Incumbents come and go, but values endure, and it's the values that we invest in. I wasn't a politician for nothing. <laughs> Thank you very much for your remarks. They're, they're wonderfully provocative. I think it's important to link the two thoughts that you've expressed, that we should, we should emphasize and support a value-based system, and we should have, I think you were saying, fiscal responsibility, because if we don't have fiscal responsibility, in the end, we don't have the strength to under to support the values-based system. It takes a lot of investment and, and money and all the, all the resources we have to stand by our value-based system. So I'd just like to see if you agree that we should bring those two together in, in what your comments and the site. Uh, th thank you for your question. And in a sense, I uncharacteristically underplayed the fiscal responsibility bit. New Zealand, as you may know, uh, in effect, the, the, the city nearest to where I live and where Sue lives suffered a devastating earthquake in 2011. Uh, and that, among other reasons, demonstrated to us why, why you must always be responsible against the day when you're made extremely vulnerable. 
Uh, and so the, the, the rainy day, uh, if you like, to be hugely fiscally responsible because you don't know what's going to be thrown at us. At the moment, it's a trade war. Uh, there are seismic shifts that are occurring in geopolitics, but we suffered a seismic event of a physical kind, and it drained uh, all of our resources for the first time since I was in office. We went into deficit for good and compelling reasons. So what have we got to do to keep ourselves safe? Yes, we need a defence system. Yes, we need an international rules-based order. But yes, we need fiscal responsibility. So when I became the Minister of Finance, never in my adult lifetime had New Zealand balanced its budget. Uh, our nationally owned bank had gone bust, and I didn't know about it uh, when we were campaigning for office. So that was another impost that I hadn't counted on. Uh, and we had debt that was soaring to 100% of GDP. Uh, and my commitment to the country, and it took a huge amount of adjustment, as you can imagine, was we're going to live within our means, we're going to get debt down to below 20% of GDP, and we're going to balance our books. And in three years, we did all of that. We only have three-year electoral cycles. So a very, very big disruption uh, to what had been the prevailing, uh, if you like, view about the conduct of, of fiscal policy, which had been regarded as really an electoral plaything. You want to win the voters' influence, you bribe them. You bribe them with their own money and you don't care about your children's future. Well, we had two children while I was in office, only the second woman to do so in our parliament, although now our Prime Minister had a child while she was Prime Minister. Um, hats off to her uh, for managing uh, that dual responsibility. Uh, it's no mean thing when you're the leader of a country. The Minister of Finance only has to drive the engine. Uh, the Prime Minister has to be, you know, the, the star turn uh, and the crowd pleaser. Uh, and, you know, my, my promise to my children and, and the future generation was we would live with a new meat. We would not steal your future. Uh, and what's mattered enormously, we now have a government of the left in New Zealand uh, and they tied themselves to the mask that I called it the Fiscal Responsibility Act. They called it the Budget Responsibility Rules. And guess what? Debt had to be below 20% of GDP. We're going to live within our means. We're going to be careful about how we allocate resources. Uh, those rules have endured, which is why I'm such a fan of rules-based systems. You've got to have optionality. You know, there are times when a country has to put its hand in, the po in its pocket for unexpected events. That's always the nature uh, of governing. And you need to make sure you keep yourself safe uh, by the responsible conduct of public finances. One of the essays I judged, and I gave it top marks, was from the Reason Institute here in America. Look it up. They're very good. Who had been helping states in America bust the unfunded liabilities for pensions. You know, you know you've got a dreadful problem here in America, and not just your national debt but your unfunded liabilities are huge, and you don't have accrual accounting, and you haven't had a budget for ages. So, you know, there's, there's lots of black marks against the fiscal management here in America, and the Reason Foundation, in my mind, won hands down uh, the competition because they had worked hand in hand with many, many states to help them get to grips with the unfunded liability, which is, you know, here nowadays we hear climate change is effectively raping children of their future. Well, this, this was uh, effectively junking your children's future through unfunded, in this case, fiscal irresponsibility. So it is very important. If you're going to stand in the market, you've got to stand with strength. That's essentially where the two forces join. What is the current status of, of the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Uh, that's very interesting. The TPP, as it was known prior to the New Zealand election, which was two years ago, and those who currently had office campaigned in the streets against it because they saw the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was the brainchild of New Zealand. We were the ones that sponsored TPP along with Brunei, uh, Vietnam, but effectively we, we were the driver. Because I said before, we we're a small country. We've got to trade with the world to make our standard of living and to lift our standard of living. So we drove a very torturous route, finally got to TPP. The current government campaigned against us. And lo and behold, 
they were elected by, we've got a, the German proportional representation system, so the Conservative Party got more seats, more votes than the, the Socialist Party, but the Populist Party in the middle went with the Socialist Party. So everybody thought TPP is gone busters. No, no. Because when you are a Prime Minister in New Zealand, you never, ever, ever do anything other than sponsor free trade. And to the huge credit of the current Prime Minister, she was taken behind the bike sheds by our trade officials and said, here's where you sign. Now, we're going to do some tweaking. We did some window dressing. We called it something else. We got Trudeau into the act. Well, you'd love to have Trudeau on your side, wouldn't you? Uh, and he was even dressed properly as he came to the, to the... But he had the language, right? He had his white face on and he had the language and they called it something else. C-T-T-P or T-C-P, whatever acronym you want. The same thing prevailed, which is all of the parties concerned except for America. Big black mark. Big, big black mark. America decided that she was going to go her own isolationist ways. Now, when ever, ever, ever has America prevailed when she is isolationist? She's had to be prodded and pulled, and I'm not saying that America should engage in follies and foreign adventures that have no business of the American population. But to say no to free trade? What were they thinking? Big black mark. So I'm sure when our Prime Minister talked to your current president this week, the first words to come out of her lips after he said, I'm sorry about the massacre in Christchurch, our home city, I'm sure were the first words, he's human after all, the second words from her would have been, now Mr President, what about a free trade agreement? That's the biggest thing on our agenda. So it survives, it was signed in Japan, uh, it's now becoming uh, the, the mode for about 40% of the world's trading regime. Uh, to be able to compete on the basis of your merits, not on the basis of some politician's view of protectionism. Big black mark for President Trump. I've, I've said it, I've said it. A little bit of background information. I arrived in Hong Kong in 1973 and I made my first trip into China in 1976. Wow. In the subsequent 20 something years, I lived in Hong Kong and made numerous visits into China. I could never have envisaged the development that has taken place, even during that 20 years or so, and what has taken place in the subsequent 20 years is totally unbelievable. The primitive situation in China, in, in, in the cities, let alone the countryside, in, in the 70s, was they were just they were recovering after the appalling situations that, that uh, Chairman Mao had introduced into the country. I can remember driving, being driven by uh, from a taxi from the airport into the Beijing Hotel and being told by the taxi driver that he had spent a number of years working on a farm. He was a university student, but he was not able to pursue his education. And as a result, he was driving a taxi in Beijing. But moving on, we started to do business uh, via Hong Kong in China in 19, starting 1979. Um, started to actually do direct business in Hong Kong, in China in the early 80s. You could not have social intercourse with the people you dealt with yeah. at that time. Your contacts were limited to the office, the meeting, business meetings, uh, to uh, formal banquets where you had to deal with copious servings of Mao Tai, which uh, after a while one got rather, rather clever at sitting behind or sitting in front of potted plants so you could deposit your Mao Tai over the of plants. And I'll tell you, it's wonder why their potted plants will sit the next day. Anyway. Um, we gradually, it gradually progressed where we started to have social contact with, with people we're dealing with. To the extent that we used to to uh, hire suites in the hotels, so that the people we were dealing with could come and take showers because they did not have hot running water in their accommodation. That stopped overnight in Tiananmen after Tiananmen. There was it was a shocking event. Everyone felt that China was moving forward. Um, Deng Xiaoping uh, came along 
declared there were many ways to, to um, skin a cat, etc. But uh, just to add a little side piece here, a colleague of mine was working with the American Embassy at the time, and he was a fluent Mandarin speaker, and he toured, he toured Beijing on a bicycle, visiting the hospitals and the mortuaries, and his conclusion at the end was that the actual uh, fertilities after Chenmin were in the hundreds rather than thousands. Now, I just offer that as an opinion, not uh, as an opinion expressed by a colleague, not as a fact. But moving on, we start, it took some time after uh, Chenmin for us to re-establish business connections and to get the free-flowing uh, business in China. But the one thing we found all the time was that the Chinese would be looking, understandably looking after their own interests. And whatever was said that you thought you had got a ironclad contract, no, because it could be, if it was written in Chinese, it could be interpreted in various ways. So ultimately, we took a very, very cautious approach in doing business in, in China. And I think it paid off. I think it paid off. We didn't lose a lot of money. We didn't make a huge amount of money. But we didn't fall into the trap that some of the major US companies fell into and are now feeling the pinch in terms of the, the trade situation that is going on at the moment. I, I, I honestly don't know where it's going. I don't believe that America would benefit by introducing the type of penalties that our current president is opting for, proposing, etc. Because ultimately, we need a free flow of trade between the two countries. Uh, I'm indebted to you for your motai uh, hints. So my way of dealing with it is to have my husband drink it. So he gets drunk, not me, right? <laughs> that, that, that's maybe not such a good alternative. Pot plants, and oh, we'll try that next time. Very good. C c sorry, have you finished, sir? Yeah, okay. I mean, China has bought, as you say, in your trading and business lifetime in, in those domains, there's been nothing short of miraculous. 400 million people have come out of poverty. The vibrancy now. Is, is incredible to behold. I mean, I go there a lot, and you know, even in six months you can be out of date. The vibrancy is just amazing. And Deng Xiaoping uh, can take a lot of credit for that, and, and he also gets a big slap. Because Deng Xiaoping was about my size, he went down to Shenzhen, uh, he uttered the famous, you know, socialism by any other uh, spots as long as it works. So he effectively unleashed the open economy, and they went like gangbusters. They suppressed capitalists, the Chinese, but the suppression is still there. Uh, they went like gangbusters. Deng, to his huge shame, was in fact still in, in office when Tiananmen, he, 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 he made the decision on Tiananmen Square. I mean, how many people were killed? They mashed them up and washed them down the drain. I mean, who, who knows, who knows? What was killed was a moment. Right? What was killed was the idea of freedom. That's what was killed. And, you know, while Deng said cross the river by feeling for the stones, we've now reached another brick wall. Um, you seem to end your, your contribution, thank you, with, you know, I don't know, is this the right thing to do? This is as, as existential a moment as 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall and the invention of the internet. We are dealing with a huge new force globally. It's a huge new economic force, it's a huge new political force, and it's a huge malign force. Because China is, when I was quoting from the New Zealand Strategic Defence Review, does not share our value-based system. And they will not, because it's not in their psyche, they will not give us a break. They will not embrace the idea that liberalism might be a better idea. That's why two million people in Hong Kong, they're gone busters by 2047. I mean, the treaty that Patton, the Brits signed, 
uh, with the Chinese mean they only have to play a waiting game. And there's no way China's going to send in tanks to Hong Kong. They're not that stupid. Um, they'll sacrifice Carrie Lam in due course and they'll sort of play the waiting game because 2047 is not long to go before it all folds in anyway. Taiwan and Macau will be looking on this saying, oh, excuse me, if we ever flirted with the idea we might be a special administ administrative region, no way, Jose. The really dangerous thing is Xi has now accrued to himself all the power that Mao had. Because when Deng came along after Mao, they effectively had a distribution of power. Now, not the, the, the sharing of power as you do in America through your three great institutions. Not that kind of check and balance. But they did it their way, and they're allowed to do it their way, which is, you know, you can have the Communist Party, you know, you can have the Parliament, you know, you can have the courts, you can have the military. Xi has accumulated that all to himself, again. It is hugely dangerous, and now he's got economic might. You know, when Deng and Mao were there, in the end, I mean, Mao completely wasted his people. You know, how many people died in, in his 44 million of that order? Uh, and then, you know, he had his pluses and, and minuses. But Xi is now with a very, very strong hand because the pact with his people is, I will give you economic prosperity, and it's there, it's palpable. But you give us political surveillance. You give us political supremacy. So that the investment in artificial intelligence is just horrific because that is the tool of the despot. You know, now you, you get social credit, you know, everywhere you go, the eyes are there, the eyes are there. You know, even to get into the Communist Party Museum, I had to give them my fingerprint. To get into China now, you know, here's your fingerprint, but then to America too. But you know they're going to do different things with it in China than they do in America. And the artificial intelligence now effectively watches every single action of their people. And if you, quote-unquote, misbehave, you lose your social credit, you lose your liberty, you can't buy a train ticket, you can't buy an airline ticket. So one of the big ruses, oh, yes, yes, we care about intellectual property because the Americans are thundering at us. So we're going to five times the, the uh, penalty for breaching somebody's intellectual property and you're going to lose some social credit scores. Yeah, right. It's the mentality. That's what we're dealing with. We are dealing with a mindset so antithetical to ours. This is a battle worth joining. And the issue is, what are going to, what is America prepared to bear? Quite a lot. If I was a soybean farmer, I'd be pretty uh, basically feeling very hurt by getting caught in this crossfire. But this is a fight worth having. We're never going to get China, as, as I said in, in my main address, we're never going to get China to change its political system. Ultimately, that will be a matter for their people but we can get them to change their international behaviour, and we must. Um, the American public, for understandable reasons, is uh, engrossed at the moment in considering its own naval uh, within domestic issues. But uh, could you give us some comments about the Belt and Road Initiative? Well, first of all, America should not be looking at the state of your democracy and being pessimistic about it. You know, I mean, democracies, uh, the mood comes and goes, the individual come and, come and go, but it's the institution that matters. You've got a choice. You can chuck the bastards out in the end if voters are moved to do so. It's very different to the system, obviously, as you know, in China. So the Belt and Road Initiative is a very, not very cunning plan on the part of China to secure its influence and, and its impact by other means. And you do it like this. So that the Belt and Road is an initiative that effectively licenses the outreach by Chinese businesses in every single domain, because it's not the old physical Belt and Road. Moving to our Philippines, Indonesia, down the Pacific. You know, it, it, it's a figurative Belt and Road. And it is a triumphal exercise in Chinese view about its own influence and power. So, you know, I'm holding uh, another quote from, from Pompeo, uh, who, who said, and, and it was a great one, serving up a sharp rebuke on China's drive into Southeast Asia, Pompeo said on Friday, we are not building roads to pave over your national sovereignty, China is, 
and we don't fund bridges to close gaps of loyalty, which China is. That, that, that's what the Belt and Road is. Now, New Zealand has um, figuratively uh, joined the Belt and Road, but with two particular characteristics. We've said, we're prepared to work with you in many of our near nation states, the Pacific Islands and Asia Pacific, which is our domain, if you like, our theatre. We're prepared to work with you by layering into two new elements to the Belt and Road. One is fiscal responsibility, because we do that really well. So you just don't go into a country and say, you're a failed state, you've mucked up in your public finances, uh, here's our money and forever you will be our liege. Uh, we've said we could actually go in and help a country develop its own regime for responsible budgeting. And the second initiative with which the Prime Minister shadowed in, or foreshadowed in the United Nations two days ago, our Prime Minister, uh, was to attach, um, if you like, climate change conditionality around the Belt and Road. You know, calling out China, because China and, and uh, India are, are the biggest carbon emitters in the world. Uh, and so those, those are the two... This is New Zealand trying to live in the two worlds. You know, this is over half of our economic activity is dependent on China. Same, same with Australia. We, we, we can't just call out and say, you know, that's it, we're never going to do business with you. Of course we're going to do business with them. But we want to transact with purpose. We want to transact with principle. So the way in which we have engaged in the Belt and Road Initiative is to say we can hook on these two things that are really useful, and by the way, to the extent that our budgets will allow it, and Australia the same, we will fund alternative means of infrastructure development, particularly in the Pacific Islands, uh, where China, for the reasons of you know, sea passage, which matters, uh, is trying to buy all those Pacific states off uh, by building bridges for loyalty. Um, I'm going to try and put together, I, I would like you to um, talk about uh, climate change mm -hmm. and how New Zealand is dealing with it in, in, in the business world mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how New Zealand sees itself going forward uh, with economic growth. <clears throat> Right, what we want to do is not have a climate of burning money and virtue signalling, because that's what's going on at the moment. Will you explain that? Yeah, I will, I will. A lot of virtue signalling. We care about the climate. We care about... Mr Macron said that. I'm going to have a tiny little fuel tax, and now they're ripping up the streets of Paris. Hmm? In Australia, the Labour Party campaigning as they thought for office said, don't ask us about the cost of climate change. What about the cost of doing nothing? And the voters said, I don't think so. And they didn't vote for them. To get democratic license for some of the rhetoric just won't work. Here's some science. If every single developed country in the world today said we're not going to ever, ever have any more coal-fired power stations or infant formula plants, and I'll come to that, with what is business doing, we have no more petroleum, we're going to have no... In other words, we basically said we're going to break on all of this. You know what you'd reduce global warming by? 0.4%. Because what we have to do is to go to the developing world. And here's the rub. We got the rub of the green. In fact, it wasn't the green. We got the rub of the carbon, and we developed our economies, and now we're saying to them, well, sod you. We'll save the world, so too bad about your development. It doesn't work like that. We have to use this, and we have to use science. So what is business doing? Because a lot of this does come down to leadership, not just of a political kind. That's the virtue signalling, saying the right things. It's doing the right things that matter. So I'm a director of a publicly listed company that makes infant formula. We have dryers that produce milk powder. Dryers effectively burn the water out of the milk, and then we add other ingredients. Those dryers typically have all been coal-fired. We met in Paris as a board, as, as it happens, two years ago, and said, no more. We've just installed at huge cost to the company, and it hasn't hurt us in terms of our market uh, capitalisation. We're installing electrodes, like, like a big electric kettle to dry. So, so you, New Zealand is lucky. 80% of our energy is renewable energy, uh, and we're going to harness that energy to produce our products. 
We're doing it for the good of the planet because our mantra is we've got to report in terms of profit, people and the planet. And we've got to live within our planetary limits. America, this is your time to feel a little shame, you're living at five times your planetary limits. So there has to be disruption, there has to be change. We as a business are seeking to lead that change. A very big part of New Zealand's greenhouse gas emissions are methane. We have a lot of cattle, a lot of ruminants. Methane is much more lethal in the short term, but it's a short-lived gas, whereas carbon dioxide is a long-lived gas. We've simply got to suppress the supply of the stuff. So nitrous oxide, which is basically pissed into the soil, your ruminant discharge, which is the methane, or the carbon dioxide, we have got a responsibility as a big part of the New Zealand economy, the dairy sector, to take a leadership position. So we have committed ourselves to targets. You know, by 2025, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to plant, this is how we're going to use science to better apply fertilisers, to reduce methane, but we have to use science to do it. And I'll tell you, here's the rub. Our New Zealand plant scientists have, using genetic engineering, have produced a, a um, grass that will reduce methane emissions by 35%. Fantastic. We can't deploy it in New Zealand because we have law that say no GMOs. It's crazy. We're shooting it. And you know who's going to benefit from, from, from our endeavour, our smarts? The American farmer, because all of the field trials have been done here, because America's not so loopy on the matter. We have to use, we have to embrace science. We went up to Holland last year to a firm called DSM that used to be a coal company, and they have got what's called the Happy Cow Project. They can, by the use of CRISPR technology, which is not using external new genes inserted into the DNA of, of an entity, but just simply eliminating or adjusting the genes in, in the integrity of that one entity, they've produced a feedstock that will reduce methane by up to 70%. I mean, New Zealand is going gangbusters to use the science to solve the problems. We've got to be intelligent and proactive about this. And there's a business reason for doing so. We work with Danone, which is one of the biggest dairy companies in the world. We can't do business with them unless we show a really responsible plan for the planet. So you've got to do so with, with um, real direction, uh, considered decision making, using the science, holding yourself to high standards, being proactive. So we, we effectively pay our milk producers not to use palm kernel, which most farmers do around the world because of the deforestation in Indonesia and the Philippines. We pay them not to do that. We are subsidising better behaviour, just as we're subsidising an electrode as opposed to a, a coal-fired burner. So that's the kind of, we can and should do a lot. If we just took what is the raw, if you like, target the, the government has set, because they want a virtue signal, and we become carbon neutral by 2050, that will cost us the whole of our GDP. Well, the is not going to vote for that. You've got to do so, you've got to have a social licence to operate, which means you've got to show you're serious about living within planetary limits, and you've got to have an electoral licence to operate, which is you've got to take your voters with you. Thank you.